welcome to anyone who's visiting. I pray that you would uh, be encouraged, challenged, and fed from God's Word as we uh, come and as we gather this evening. I'm uh, leading this evening. My name's Mark, and in a little while, uh, uh, Sergey, one of our church members, will be preaching from God's Word. Uh, and I actually uh, want to just start with God's Word. I read this psalm uh, this morning in, in my try and read a psalm a day, and just so happened it was the shortest psalm of the psalms, uh, which means the longest psalm is coming up. Um, <laughs> but Psalm 117, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. I hope that's what we'll do this evening, that we will uh, praise the Lord, that we will uh, bask upon his great love and his faithfulness and praise him because he is worthy of praise. Before I pray, let me just, uh, just a few notices. Um, rigid cool boxes are needed for camp. Um, uh, if you can lend a rigid cool box, then please bring it by the 26th of July. That would be really helpful. Um, and then just uh, just a heads up, it's small group this week. Uh, so just be aware of, of that. Um, all the other information, if you have the Friday email, just, just look at the Friday email. If you want to know anything else, just speak to me afterwards. So you, this is for, I don't know, this is for all you old people who want to go down and put, <laughs> you can't use the lower hall because it is now got lots of mad stuff. We're only, what, two weeks away from mad camp, two weeks today we'll be going. Um, so we've got yeah, plenty of stuff down there. So uh, people who are tempted to go down and play table tennis, you're just going to have to rein that temptation in and chat with us up here. Uh, <laughs> Let me pray, shall I? Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your great love. We praise you and thank you that you are a God whose love endures forever, whose faithfulness endures forever. We thank you that uh, you're a God that should be praised by all nations. A God that is worthy of praise. Lord, we come to you this evening seeking to praise you, seeking to worship you, seeking to learn from your words, to be fed from your words, to be encouraged, challenged, Lord. Would you deal with us this evening by the power of your Spirit? Would you show us more of the truths of your word and would they be uh, ever more clear to us and shape us so that we might live for you? Lord, we thank you for Jesus we thank you that you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that the gospel is good news, that uh, is, is not only uh, good news to be proclaimed, but good news that uh, means that we can sing and praise and, uh, and lift our hearts and our voices up to you. So help us to do that this evening. Help us to lift up our voices, lift up our hearts, lift up our eyes to you. Would you draw close to us? as we seek to uh, think about uh, so the truths contained in your word from Luke as Sergei comes, Lord, and, and preaches your word, Lord. Would you be especially close to him and help him through your spirit? And Lord, would you help us to be fed and nourished as we think about the wonders contained in your gospel? We pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, let's uh, praise the Lord, shall we, by uh, singing that wonderful hymn, Great is the Gospel. Great is the Gospel. Let's stand to sing together.
you've got a Bible with you, please turn to Luke's Gospel, to Luke uh, chapter 16. We're going to be reading from verse 19 to the end of the chapter. It's great that we can read God's words aloud, freely. And we need God's help as we consider his words. So let's read together, shall we? There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, And I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father, Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. As I said, we, we do need God's help, don't we, to listen to his word and understand his word. So uh, let me pray, and then we'll sing again, and then Sergei will come up and preach from God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful passage. Lord, we pray that your spirit would speak to us and help us as, as Sergei is preaching it, to, to see the truths of it, that you would help Sergei to bring out these truths, make them clear to us, and, and apply them to our hearts, we pray. We need your help so much. So, Lord, we pray, come, come and help us this evening so that you would get all the glory and your church would be built up in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing again then before Suge comes uh, and preaches it from this passage. We're, we're going to sing, O oh Jesus, I have promised. Just bring the first verse up if you can, John. O oh Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end. Be now and ever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if you are by my side, nor wander from the pathway if you will be my guide. Let's stand and sing together.
Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> so we are going to look at this passage. It's quite interesting passage and uh, one of my favorite. Uh, it taught me a great lesson I thought I might share with you. Um, Luke, unlike Apostle Paul, he pretty much developed the gospel uh, presentation through picture language. If Paul was kind of uh, adopted Greek style and was clearly debating points based, you know, this and then we move to this, to this. Luke explained the same things in picture language. See, he used lots of lots of parables that Jesus taught his disciples um, to point out to various things. And one of the things we're going to look tonight at different values where the values that can lead people to different places, hell and heaven, and how to choose the right one. And that parable is based on the conversation that Jesus just had with Pharisees. And verse 14 above says that Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. Pharisees had a set of values that contradicted Jesus teaching. They were praised by people, they were very, very wealthy, they had power, and they loved different pleasures of life. Joseph Flavi, in his uh, famous book, uh, Jewish War, uh, wrote um, half a page about Nicodemus, you know, the famous character in the Bible where we see Nicodemus met Jesus during the night. And he referred to Nicodemus that he had the wealth, enough wealth to feed the whole Jerusalem for three years. And at the time, Jerusalem population was estimated at about 100,000 people. So if we add to that, say, 10 pounds a day for a person for three years, that my calculation is correct, around a billion pounds. That was the wealth of Nicodemus, and he wasn't the wealthiest. The Gospel of John just points that he was wealthy. <laughs> uh, that he wasn't by himself. So it was a common thing because Pharisees were the first people who developed a practice where first you built up your wealth or your capital, and then capital works for you and you receive dividends. And now the whole West lives uh, with these principles. We call this investment. Uh, but these are the Pharisees that developed it because they, they realized the power value uh, and value of money. And they loved it very, very much. Because money gave them power. They were appointed to Sinedrion, as we know, the, 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 the ruling council. So they ruled their own people. And money also gave them opportunity to experience all sorts of pleasures. For example, they they, they quite loved a uh, uh, culture of sex because <clears throat> even Jesus himself calls them wicked and adulterous generation. And they introduce a very interesting practice. They um, basically, uh, to call, you know, it's, it's a massive uh, um, leaflet that kind of they wrote. But the main point of that is this, that they married a woman, and at some point, if they don't like woman anymore and she, she's getting old, they got rid of her easily through divorce, and they would marry again, and they would die again. And if they married what was called political marriage, so another's Pharisee's daughter, they would keep her because, because that's political, then they would have another wife. And through that, they didn't use prostitutes, but they were legally changing and adding wives, as many as they like, uh, because money gave them the power, and they could pay to the fathers of those ladies enough money to have new wives, and so on. And so they had power, th they had money, lots of money, they had pleasures in life. They had everything they wanted. To add to that, they developed a philosophy which is 
well known in this world as karma. You might be surprised, but karma comes from Hinduism, right? And basically, the idea is that you you get what you deserve. But they develop things like God is just; He never does and He never ever would do unjust thing to anyone, right? So if you are poor, if you are ill, if accident happened to you, if something bad in your life, this is God judgment. And if you're good, wealthy, healthy, smile, that means God is good to you, he blesses you. Yeah? What we know these days, prosperity gospel, um, they were the first developers of it. And therefore, what they thought was that if you see a person who struggles, who is poor, who is uh, ill, etc., etc., you don't interfere because this is God's judgment. You don't want to fight with God. You, so, so through this philosophy, they ignored the rest of the nation who were not at their level. And that's why when we read another parable, you know, that of a, a Samaritan, poor Samaritan, um, we see the Pharisee just, just pass by, not my business, this is God's judgment, uh, and let that person deal with the consequences. He doesn't suffer for nothing. He must have done something bad in his life. That's why uh, he is there, where he is, yeah, in those circumstances. So, so, so they kind of distinct themselves from, from the rest of the uh, Jewish people who were not wealthy and healthy and on their level and enjoyed life to the full. They had the power, they had the money, and they had all the pleasures they could uh, have in this life. And so we have here Jesus who says, mm. basically he's in, in common language, he said, unless you are much better than those people, those Pharisees, you will never enter kingdom of God. Yeah. That was shock to the system, that kind of claims. And here, Luke wants to share with us something else to show that God sees differently. God judges differently. And we can learn from it how to be on the right side to end up in a good place, like Lazarus did. This is a parable. Just to, just to make it clear, this is a parable, this is not a real story, though we have a name, Lazarus, mentioned. Uh, Lazarus is actually, uh, in Hebrew, called El Lazar, which means the one who God helps. Um, but this is parable because Jesus introduces that, he shows two extremes, uh, yeah, one is as bad as possible, the other one is as, you know, the best. But also he shows that there is a talk, we can see, we will see it a bit later, between a rich man and Abraham, and he talks about, and then he, he, he thinks he wants to send, he cares, you know. There are also things happening here which don't happen in real life. We know from other passages. Uh, but here Jesus sort of, adds these bits a bit so, so people would have a bit more understanding about hell and heaven and what leads to those two places. So if we first talk about the Lazarus situation and then we will look at the rich man because there is more to a rich man's story than to Lazarus. So we are told here that at the gate where the rich man lived was laid a beggar named Lazarus. So we see here, he was late, yeah? he was a disabled person. He didn't walk there in a free will. He was late, and in those days it was a common practice because then rich people could always notice them and at least could give them something, even leftovers of their food or some, some money or something. So somebody in the mercy probably laid that Lazarus uh, at the gate. Right? But he wasn't just disabled, he was also ill. He says, covered with sores, right? Some kind of skin disease. It could be 
maybe it wasn't plague, maybe it was not as severe, something like that, but something nasty, something that in, in, in Old Testament law would consider Lazarus as an unclean person, right? So he suffered physically, but he also suffered emotionally because un, un, uh, socially, because an unclean person wouldn't be touched. Um, and then to add to his uncleanness, we see that in verse 21, even the dogs came and licked his sores. But dogs are unclean animals. So they added to his uncleanness even more uncleanness in people's eyes because those dogs um, licked his sores. And if that's not enough, we, we are told here that well, again, verse 21, that he loaned to it what fell from the rich man's table. He was hungry. He was hungry. So, disabled, ill, constantly hungry, not provided for, rejected by the people. What else can we deduce from this passage? Well, obviously, being unclean and being disabled, there's no way for him to go to a temple. <coughs> that means no relationship with God, as Jewish people would understand it. He couldn't bring a sacrifice. He couldn't pray to God, thank him and ask him something at the, at the temple. He wouldn't be able to socialize with other Jewish people. My friends, maybe you have family, yeah? And maybe your wife is not as perfect as you would want her to be. But this man hasn't got a wife at all. Maybe your children, far from being perfect, right? But I'm sure Lazarus would want to have some. He hasn't got any. There is nothing in life to live for. There is nothing. Pain, rejection, lost opportunities. But we know Lazarus ended up in heaven. So he was a believer. Yeah, that, that's the reason. We know that. How can we know that from this passage that he was a believer? Well, two things that are not said here, but we can easily deduce. Things that he didn't do, first of all. Things that he didn't do. What happens to a person, unbeliever, who doesn't know God and who is put in very, very difficult circumstances? Usually two things, two outcomes. One is, is a suicide. And what we call in, in people who are weak in their own spirit. Yeah, They can't cope with life anymore. They find it too hard. And the only way out is suicide. But Lazarus doesn't do it. And second thing is that you, what people usually do, if they don't like life, they rebel. And we've, we've had, in history, we've had many revolutions based on that. Yeah, when, when poor people, evil people, they, they rebel against those rich, against those in power, and then they, they won't share of it, don't they? And we, we experience that, we know that even in this country, the war, not to the same extent perhaps as in France or Russia, but um, we know monarchy is not, hasn't got as much power as it used to be, even in this land. But he doesn't repel either. He has no wife. He waits on God. He is poor. He waits on God. He is ill. He waits on God even more. He is hungry and he waits on God. He doesn't rebel. He doesn't commit suicide. He still perseveres and trusts him. He, is, he longs to have fellowship with other believers. He longs to go to temple, to bring sacrifice, to listen once more from God's word. He can't have it. He waits on him. And there we have 
of course, with that kind of lifestyle, life expectancy is not high, is it? So he dies much earlier than the rich man. Natural. And what happens to him? The, came, the time came when the beggar died. <laughs> There's no burial. There is no honor mentioned here, unlike to rich man, when he said he was buried. Yeah, he received the last honor. This man didn't. Probably he would be put by social services in those days into those places which was actually called hates. You know, the, the constant fire on the back of the city where all the rubbish was burned and dead people who, who could not afford proper burial. That's what we have with Lazarus. And yet, he dies. And immediately, next second, angels carried him to Abraham's side. The Bible, when the Bible portrays angels, they're mighty, mighty beings. They're much, much more powerful than humans. They serve God directly. They see his face. They stay in his presence. And those mighty beings serve this unknown, unwanted, rejected, forgotten person called Lazarus. They take him to Abraham. They take him to the place which God prepared forever for those who trusted him, who waited on him, who did not rebel, who accepted all circumstances that God gave them in life. And he enjoys it forever. Now, then Luke tells us about the other character here, and the other character called Rich Man. He hasn't even got the name because from God's perspective, it's irrelevant. This guy is nobody. But from people's point of view, he was great. Look at that. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. He had everything. Nice clothes, which was very, very expensive those days. Anything his heart desired, he could have it. A party, no problem. To see various People, people with influence, powerful people, no problem. Anything the money could buy, just name it. He could have wives, he could have palaces, he could have clothes, he could have food. Anything you can think of, he did have. And what he did with that, he actually enjoyed it every day. Every day he spent all his wealth on himself. And he died at some point, much later than Lazarus. And he was buried. So he received an honor as well from, from people because people came so oh, this was a great man. You know, we, we need to pay him a tribute. And, and he was buried properly as everyone should be. But the difference is, as soon as he died, we read in verse 23, in Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He ended up in Hades. Why? Because he was not a believer. How do we know that? Well, first of all, of course, we know the result, that right? he ended up in hell. So, Obviously, he wasn't a believer. But the passage also gives us some other clues why he was not a believer. First of all, we read that he had all this wealth, all this luxury, etc. But he knew Lazarus because Lazarus was placed on his gate. And we talk, uh, and later on he says, well, can you send Lazarus, please, and, and you know, give me some... Um, 
half pity me was you know we were reading 24 and saint lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue he knows who lazarus is he, he recognized him he knew him did he help him at all are we told here he helped lazarus he made his life easy he fed him he looked after him he provided opportunities for him to visit the temple he helped to clean his diseases hmm? no no why not he didn't care about lazarus he lived life to the full for himself he was very selfish he was not the believer as we know that right second thing is he knows he has heard god's word but did not want to respond to it. Because when he argues with Abraham, and Abraham says, well, in verse 29, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. He says, no, 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 Father Abraham. Now we can deduce, he talks from the experience. There's no point just, just, just if they listen. Yeah, because he listened and he ended up in hell. No, 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 that's not good enough. They need to see somebody risen from the dead. And only then... They will listen to Moses and his law. To which Abraham said, no, that's not the case. So he knew he was Jew. He calls Abraham father. He knows well who Abraham is. He knows his relationships. He knows status. He knows inheritance. He knows the law. He knows who Lazarus was. But knowing all of that, he did Nothing. He did not obey that law. He did, not did, he did not do what the law prescribed, to love your God with all your heart and with everything you have. Because all his life he spent on himself. All his resources, his wealth, his status, his power, he spent on himself, living in luxury every day. He did not care a thing about God or about other people. And that's why he is in hell. Not because he was rich, but because how he reacted to his circumstances. He did not like what God said in his law. He did not like other people, and he was selfish. The other thing is interesting that Jesus talks here a lot about hell. Actually, Jesus talked about hell more than any other authors in the Bible. He even talked more than all other authors combined about hell. Because hell was very vivid in Jesus' teaching. And he knew what the place was and he came here to save people from hell. He knows it's real. He knows how painful it is. And that's why he saves people from it, this place. But if we just explore a little bit here. So what happens here? What is hell? Well, first of all, hell does not change people for better. Right? Well, how do we know that? Well, you see, the guy, rich man, ended up in hell. So he sees Lazarus over there in heaven. Right? He recognizes Lazarus. He recognizes Abraham. How does he react to this? You think, well, surely he would repent. Surely he would realize that maybe he's done something wrong in life and he would ask God to forgive him. Surely he would know he behaves the same way as he did. So he says, send Lazarus and let him serve me. Yeah, let him do this and that. And then send somebody else to my brothers. He still behaves like he's in charge. He still behaves like everything just, just belongs to him. He just, uh, uh, you know, he clicks the finger and, and it will be provided for him. His heart does not change at all. People will spend millions of years in hell. It will not make them better. They will never repent of their sin. They will still think as they think now, I am God for myself and everyone should obey me. And they will think that in hell. 
But the other thing is, the, the kind of conditions of hell, they all, you know, this, this rich man, he suffers greatly. Why is that? Because hell is a place where God takes away all the things that he gave here on earth. You said you, you hated me. God says, fine. If you won't live without me, fine. But what is life without me? It's hell. So in this life, God gives you health. In hell, he takes it away. So this person is in pain. In this life, God gives you relationships. He gives you friendships, family. Here in hell, the rich man is lonely. Think about it. There must have been millions of people who already died before this rich man. But they're all lonely there. There is no relationships. There is no fellowship. Nothing like that. If he, in, on this life, he's had lots of things to do. Here is his absolutely boredom. You know, there's nothing to do. Just pain. In this life, you had plans. You had future to think through. In hell, there is no future. There are no plans. You can do nothing. It's an awful place. And so Jesus spends time to explain, to expand, so people will get the idea a hell is an awful place. And why this man got to this place? What else we can learn from that? <clears throat> it's interesting that this rich man talks to Abraham and he's concerned for his brothers, right? Obviously, in real hell, it doesn't happen. But again, we're, we're having a parable here. And he said, like, Lord, if you, if you, well, Abraham, if you send someone, Lazarus, yeah? Lazarus, send him back. He rises from the dead. And he will talk to my brothers and they, what they will believe toward. It's replied, no, no. If they don't listen to already existing message, they will not believe even somebody rises from the dead. What does it teach us? When I first became Christian, I thought, well, how nice would it be to meet Jesus in real uh, bodily form? How blessed those Christians, apostles, and other Christians were because they could actually see Jesus face to face. They, they talked to him. They... They could ask questions. They, they saw miracles. They, you know, uh, they saw his wisdom and power and glory. How lovely would that be to do that? And actually then, having seen all of that, then go and serve him, knowing, seeing yourself. Wouldn't, be the, wouldn't I be in a much better spiritual position? And apparently, not. Not. Because what we have here, the detailed report about all these events is good enough for us as if we have been there ourselves, as if we have seen it ourselves, as if we have experienced it ourselves. We don't need miracles. We don't need resurrected Jesus seen face to face. We don't need all these experiences. It's enough for us to have a report of it, the scriptures, because through scriptures speaks God himself. So if you say tonight, if you're not a Christian, you think, well, yeah, that's a story. How do I know it is true? My friend, this scripture tells you that if you don't believe it, then nothing at all would convince you. Even if you met today somebody who rose from the dead, that would not convince you. What is written here is good enough. Therefore, the stories we have today about hell, it's real. It's detailed enough for us. It tells you what it is like and it tells you how people end up in hell. Not because of their financial situation, because they're rich and poor. No, 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 nothing to do with that. It's their attitude. 
One person lives for himself and uses all available resources for himself and enjoys life to the full for himself, hates God's law, doesn't want to do his will, ends up in hell. And the other person hasn't got much. In fact, wants to have more. Goes through all sorts of tests and trials and sufferings. But he doesn't compare himself to others. He just waits on God. He trusts him. He knows the place that he goes to is real and heaven will be forever, unlike this life on earth. And therefore, he sacrifices his hopes, his expectations, his joy for the sake of future. Isn't that foolish? Well, yes. If, if, if heaven didn't exist, that would be foolish. But it does exist. And we are told here, we've got full detailed report about it. We can trust it, absolutely, with confidence, as if we were there ourselves. So tonight, my friends, we've got another choice. And if you made already a profession of faith, and we already said, Jesus, I follow you, perhaps it's another challenge and refreshment for us. There was a time when you fell on your knees and you repented and you said, you are my Lord. I will do whatever you tell me. I will give you whatever I have. And that was a nice thing to do. And you received mercy and grace and forgiveness and in your life. But what about today? Today God comes to you again and asks the same question. Are you still willing to sacrifice all your resources? For my sake? Are you still persevering through difficult circumstances when you don't receive what other people do or what you would want to have, but you don't have it? Do you choose sin or do you choose righteousness? Do you trust me or do you live like non Christians? He asks us again, and he doesn't just leave us in those debates and challenges. He, he then moves us and says, look, look at the perspective. Look at where you go. Look what awaits for you. Look what life will be like when you get there. Here you might be nobody. But there, the angels, the mighty beings will carry you personally to that place. And Jesus himself will meet you. And there you will see his face. The one who you trusted, the one who you waited, the one who you wanted to see, you will see. On the other hand, there is a severe message to those who reject it, who think, well, this life is all we can have. No, it's not. If you think like that, yeah, God let you to enjoy things for a while. But then you end up in a place where you want to be. You want to be in a place where there is no God. You hate him. You hate his law. Fine. You'll get it. You'll get a place where there is no God. No, his, there is no his mercy, no kindness, no any blessings. That place called hell, where you will experience only judgment. May the Lord bless us that starting another week in our life, we will be thinking about it and perhaps reviewing our values. Are we still, do we still live like this poor man, Lazarus? Perhaps being nobody, but then at the same time serving God with what we have, waiting for him. Or do we live like this man who uses all his resources for his own pleasure? It's a question. It's a question for us from Luke and ultimately from Jesus himself. Where you are? Which side are you on? And what are your values? And may the Lord bless us that we will choose the right values and we will choose to honor God, trusting him without seeing him. 
reading his word, knowing that these things did happen and those places do exist, because one day we will see it in real. Amen. you, Sergei. It's um, transitioning into a time of communion now. And it's probably a, an apt thing to consider uh, just the wonders of the gospel, the truths of the gospel, uh, why we can actually have communion. And in fact, let me read to you uh, a few verses from 1 Corinthians, uh, not 1 Corinthians 11, as we normally do, uh, but 1 Corinthians 15, just a few verses. And Paul says right at the beginning, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. I always find it staggering, the, the, the various problems that the Corinthian church has had. And you think the main problem is that they've forgotten the gospel, so Paul just start with that. But he waits until chapter 15 and says, I want to remind you of the gospel. And communion is a reminder of the gospel. It's a visible and physical touch and taste of the gospel. When we come and we eat together, we come uh, and we remember Christ, we remember the gospel of Christ, we remember what Christ has done in his life and his death, his resurrection, particularly his death, his sacrifice. And as we take communion, it's a good time just to, just to re-remember to remind ourselves, remind ourselves of the gospel that I'm sure for many of us have been preached again and again. And picking up what Sergei has, has said, which you received and which you've taken your stand, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Keep on believing in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are a believer this evening, then please join in and take and eat and drink. Uh, we ask that if you've, uh, if, you're, if you've just become a Christian, you're part of this church, then uh, you refrain from eating and drinking until you get baptized. We want you to see you're baptized first, but otherwise, uh, please, uh, if you're visiting and you're, you're a Christian, please join in uh, with this meal together. We remember, but also as we eat and as we drink, uh, Christ is present in a special way through his Spirit as we're nourished afresh. And it's by that eating and that drinking as well that we remember and we taste the goodness and the grace of God. Uh, what we do is when the bread is handed out, just keep the bread and once everybody's got the bread, we'll eat it together and then the same goes uh, with the cup. I'm going to pray and then if a, a couple of the elders could help uh, serve, that would be great. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, as we eat and as we drink together now to be reminded of that gospel and the grace, the grace of that gospel, Lord. The matters are first important that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, Lord. That the, the grace that, that Paul experienced is the grace that we can experience. And we thank you and we praise you for that. We thank you for the bread and the wine. Lord, as we eat and drink, may we experience your presence through your spirits. And may we remember just how amazing Jesus is. Remember Jesus, his body broken, his blood shed for us. And we give you praise and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So if uh, two or th one or two of the elders want to come and serve, that would be great.
Nikimatsu. This. We all got a, some bread. Let's eat and remember together. Let's serve the cup. Let's drink together.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can have this simple meal and yet this vital meal. Thank you that it's a meal of remembrance, but it's also a meal where Christ is present through your spirit. Lord, help us to nourish more on the grace and the goodness of the gospel, to be reminded of it. And Lord, help us to look to Jesus in all that we do. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to finish the service by singing a lovely song, uh, The Mystery of the Cross, with that lovely chorus uh, or refrain, Jesus, thank you. end with our motto text with God's word, Jude, uh, verse 24 and 25, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.